Hey Internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. Worldview Everlasting Covered Day! K.O. And on this week's Greek Tuesday, we got a whole lot of changes taking place. Got a new year, a new book, and an end of the world to look for and not look for at the exact same time. Kind of crazy, just like Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. You're going to want to stick around. We're still at that end of the world time of the church here, and Mark chapter 13 is sort of about the end of the world, although it's also about the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And it's an important text to understand because there are some really key pieces in the text that if you don't miss them, you can't mess up the end of the world scenario, and if you miss them, you're going to end up a premillennial dispensationalist trying to pin the tail on the Antichrist, and you don't want to be there. Trust me on that one. So Mark chapter 13, 24 to 39, starts off with a tremendously important phrase, but in those days. That phrase there is a mirror piece to verse 32, but concerning that day and that hour, where we see that Jesus is talking about two separate realities, both connected to the question that was asked by his disciples, which start this entire process of him preaching. That question is asked in verse 3 and verse 4 of the chapter, when his disciples were to his statement that the stones that make up the Temple Mount are going to be entirely torn down. And so they ask him, when will these things be, comma, and what will be the sign of your coming, question mark. And they ask this, like most of us would ask it, thinking it's going to be the same thing. But Jesus says, no, it's not the same thing. There's the things that are going to happen in those days when the Temple gets torn down, and then there's that day of which I am coming, which is really the emphasis of our text. Leading up into this, though, is all manner of emphasis on those days and the tribulation that will take place and did take place in AD 70 when the temple was trashed by God from heaven through Caesar. Jesus promised that the early Christians would be persecuted heavily, possibly killed. He also promised something called the abomination of desolation, which Daniel had written about. Don't have time for that one today. A lot of good information out there for that, probably being something to do with the zealots revolting and taking the temple mount to use as a fortress right before Caesar came and crushed them. It was them setting themselves up as a messianic kingdom without the Messiah, who they had actually killed and rejected. 30 years prior. Oh, snap! But in those days, English says after that tribulation, that after there, I, I'm not sure where they're getting that because the way prepositions work in the Greek, it's really important that you know what the case of the word is that follows the preposition. And the case of the word that follows the preposition that we're translating as after in the ESV uh, makes it so that we pretty much have to translate it as with, with that tribulation. In those days, with that tribulation. <laughs> We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. Hey, Internet. Uh, so you may have noticed or not, the Greek Tuesday kind of went up and went down today, and it has to do with an error. And it's not an error that undermines you know, the understanding of Mark 13 and the two different uh, questions Jesus is answering. That's all still pretty much there. But nonetheless, I put a lot of emphasis on uh, the translation of a particular preposition. And uh, I did that because when I was using uh, a resource to translate, uh, it was wrong. <laughs> and I trusted it. And I probably should have dug deeper when I thought there was an error and, and double check that. And that's my fault. So I don't want to blame the resource. It's my problem. But uh, we don't want to leave that out there and, and lead people astray or have people rely too heavily on that because it is. It's a mistake. It's wrong. But don't get me wrong. If you watch the video and you're like, yeah, it's a really great way of looking at the, you know, the destruction of the temple is what's being really talked about here. That's still true, right? All that's still true. But because it's true and we want to defend that, we don't want to have an argument defending it, which is in fact in error. If you have any questions, feel free to shoot me. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a, had a fun day here. Uh, long. Uh, it's good. You know, Thanksgiving's coming and whatnot. And so there's a lot going on with the school. But um, sorry about that, guys. Uh, I'm human too. And thank you for the internet, which has no problem fixing grammatical mistakes. Now back to our show. The sun will be darkened and the moon will no longer give its glimmering gleam. These are quotes from Old Testament prophets about the day of the Lord's wrath, which we know happened as a fulfillment of those prophecies when God destroyed Jerusalem the first time and sent people into exile. We also know these things do have a sort of symbolic pointing forward to the end of the world that on the last day there will be this sort of rolling up of heaven and earth like a scroll and great destruction and cataclysm. <laughs> Oh! 
okay, sure, fine. But that's not what Jesus is getting at here. What he's saying is what they were saying back then, that when Jerusalem gets destroyed, everything's going to be turned on its head. There will be left behind no old covenant, no security, as if you saw the stars fall out of the sky. I mean, you'd be a severe lack of security, right? Well, that's what he's talking about. And as a result of this, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. This is a direct reference to the angelic and demonic heavenly beings. And I think it really is talking about both of them because the shaking part is the taking back of headship from the devil to Jesus himself, the Christ. And the result of this shaking of the heavens is that they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with much power and glory. And who's the they? Notice our tendency to read me into that, right? It's all about me. Well, at least the humans who are there at the end of the world. But who's the they in the context? It's the powers in the heavens, right? So Jesus ascending into heaven is perceived by the powers in the heavens and this changes everything. Particularly as he ends the old covenant and begins the new. Beginning the new at Golgotha, ending the old when he destroys the temple once and for all so there can be no mistaking that it's done for. And then he, the son of man, will send, don't miss that word send there, apostello in the Greek, apostle. He will apostle his messengers to the four winds of the earth to every single corner of heaven and earth in order to, it says gather, synagogue them. Now, really interesting little tidbit. Did you know that the word church does not exist in Mark's gospel? What? The word ecclesia does not exist in Mark's gospel. Apparently there's 10 books in the New Testament which don't use the word church, but Mark does use the word synagogue, which is a word that means gathering and has the context of God's gathering his people through his word. That's right. And you know what that means. Rather than assuming this text is about Jesus coming back at the end of time, why don't you let the cues in the text saying this is about those days and the destruction of the temple inform you that this is about Jesus' ascension into heaven and his sending of his church into the world to preach the gospel while he rules with an iron scepter. Things we know are certainly true. And to you who are sitting here talking to me, disciples, from the fig tree, learn this symbolism, this lesson, this reality. When you see on a tree buds appearing, you know summer's near. When you see these things I just said happening, you know, me sending messengers into all the earth to preach the gospel, me gathering people into the church, you know, the day of Pentecost, then you know that this destruction of Jerusalem, this thing you've asked me to tell you about, is near. Yes, at the very gates. Oh, the gates of Jerusalem. Yeah. But, now we're at verse 32. But, oh, before we get to verse 32 though, where he says, but concerning that day, which is a different thing, he does make sure to emphasize that everything that he's just said will take place before this generation passes away. Mark my words, amen, amen. Yes, I say to you, this generation will not die, will not end, will not perish until every Everything I just said happens. The earth's gonna perish someday. Heaven's gonna perish someday. But my words, we know this from Mark's gospel already, right? My words always prove true. And so when I say these things will happen and then the temple will be destroyed, you can trust me on that. And when I say, but concerning that day, the day of my coming, nobody knows, not even the angels, not even me, only the father, you can trust me on that one too. And you know, stop trying to tell when it's gonna be by watching for signs and wonders. I never promise to send. Instead, be on guard and keep awake. Keep awake for what? Well, knowing that he is coming at any time and looking for that by not putting our trust in this world but putting our trust in his kingdom which is coming then our trust in his death and resurrection in our place and now keep in mind he's talking to his apostles who are going to be these preachers that he sends and he gives them a little lesson he says it's like a man who goes on a journey and anybody who does this for a long time away from his home if he has servants in his home is going to give them authority to do their job while he's gone he can't micromanage them from millions of miles away and so in this way of course he says to the gatekeeper your job is to look for me to come back and make sure nobody gets in that shouldn't be in until I get back. Yeah? Watch. Therefore, you 12 disciples of mine who I'm going to send to preach, stay awake at the task that I give you because you don't want it to be that when I come back, you've been found to be sleeping on the job. What would be sleeping on the job for an apostle, for a pastor? Well, not preaching the gospel of the cross. That would be sleeping on the job. You're not doing it for God, really. You're doing it for yourself because that's what makes God happy. Amen. <laughs> But Jesus does say, what I say to you 12, I say to everybody, the duty of the Christian, the life of the Christian in the vocation and authority in which we stand, whether that be the doorkeeper who's watching the house of God, or whether that be any other servant who's going about their task and their vocation, our task is to, with that, watch for his return. That is, believe that he is coming. This is why we say it in the creed every single week. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and I look for the resurrection and the life of the world to come, right? That is faith in Christ, who he is, what he's done 
done, what he's achieved for us, and knowing that we don't know when it's gonna be, but it is coming soon. Watch. Did I tell you Mark was awesome? I mean, Mark is awesome. I can't wait. This is gonna be a good year, except here's the problem. We're gonna be in John like this, and John's pretty awesome too, but ah, oh man, I wish I could just go through Mark. It's so good. Until next time, we hope you like what we do here at Worldview Everlasting, getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out into the world in no uncertain terms. You can help this by sending $5 a month to our Lutheran Ninja clan, helps pay the bills around here, and also we're preparing for larger things in the future. I know we promised that for a while. It is in the works, just a matter of putting all those pieces together. What is certain is without you, this internet outreach couldn't take place and we're glad to have you on board. Meanwhile, as you know, even though you might not be yourself a divine protagonist, slightly mad, but also the savior of the world, it is important that until next time, you rock on. Today I want to talk about test tube babies and why I believe they are the Nephilim as described in the Old Testament. I don't understand the words you just said.